Good morning. And uh, welcome to our worship, whether you're here in the sanctuary or watching online, it's good to have you with us this morning. Just a couple of notices. Uh, please join us for tea and coffee and fellowship in the large hall uh, at the end of the service this morning. Uh, we also received a, a wonderful message of appreciation. You'll see it on the sheet there, but I'll just read it out uh, from one of our regular online viewers who asked that we pass on thanks to the children for their super Easter bonnets last Sunday and to all the mums and dads who helped make them. They were so very much appreciated and brought a great deal of Easter cheer to those at home who worship with us as well as those who were present in church. Thank you for that and well done. And if I remember, I'll just say that to the children when they come in uh, as well, the teachers and so on. And one more thing is uh, thank you for all who helped at the community breakfast yesterday. It was very busy. There were more than 100 hot rolls distributed among folk. That's how, how uh, popular it is every Saturday at the end of the month. And there were new faces there as well among helpers and uh, folk uh, from the community. So thank you for those who helped uh, with that. Because of Easter, God who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. Let's worship God together. We sing our first hymn, crown him with many crowns, the lamb upon the throne. <clears throat> Let's join together in prayer. Let us pray. Almighty and eternal God, God of creation, the God who made the stars and space, the God who made the earth with all its dynamics and energy of the weather systems and earth movements and all the awesome power of nature. You're a God who is greater than all that we can think or imagine. We worship you, the God who sustains all things and provides for us. We worship you for you are the God who 
has come to us in Jesus to be our Savior, the one of whom we have been singing, who has now been raised and is exalted as Lord and King. And we come into your presence for you are the God who knows us so well. You're the God who can give meaning to our lives, who can guide us and direct us. The God who sees everything and misses nothing. The God who knows every detail of our lives, all the the pains that we bear and the anxieties that we carry. A God who draws near to us, risen and with us. And Lord, we pray that as we come into your presence today to worship, we might also turn from anything and everything that is against your good and perfect ways. Forgive us, Lord, for the times that we turn our backs upon you and walk away from you rather than turning towards you. Forgive us all our sins of thought thought and word and deed. And cleanse us and renew us, we pray. And we thank you that it's not just at Easter time, but throughout the year, because of Easter, that that cross stands as that guarantee of your love for us and of blood shed that we might be forgiven. And we thank you for that empty tomb and a risen Savior that reminds us even more of that promise to us. So Lord, cleanse us, renew us, refresh us, recreate us upon this your day. And Lord, we ask that you would speak to our hearts as we wait upon you in the hymns that we sing, in the thoughts of our hearts, and in your word as we hear it. Lord, by your Spirit, come to us, and may our hearts be open to all that you would say. For we ask these things through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let's sing again, uh, Lord, you have come to the seashore, our second hymn.
This morning's reading is taken from the Gospel of John, chapter 21, and the first 14 verses, and it's entitled, Jesus and the Miraculous Catch of Fish. Listen for the word of God. After Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee, it happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, also known as Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them, and they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. Jesus said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals with the fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you have just caught. So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153, but even with so many fish, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was, how the, this was now the third time Jesus had appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. Amen. Our well, third hymn is one that uh, perhaps you don't know and Eric's going to play it right through so that you can uh, hear it. It's fairly straightforward, I hope, but it's called Come, O Fount of Every Blessing. Meals are very important to us. Um, we all like eating, I suppose. Some of us eating perhaps more than we should, but meals are, are important times for celebrating a birthday, an anniversary, uh, all sorts of things when we get together and, and share that. And there are all kinds of meals mentioned 
uh, in the Bible, Jesus often ate with his friends. He, he ate with Matthew and his friends, the tax collectors, and of course got into trouble for it. He ate at Martha and Mary's at Bethany. They, they looked after him there. He ate at Peter's uh, when he went back after he'd been in the synagogue, he went back for a meal and Peter's mother-in-law, if you remember, was ill uh, and Jesus healed her. He went back for his Sunday lunch, perhaps we might call that. He had uh, a meal in the open air with 5,000 guests of bread and fish. And more somberly, he had the meal at the Lord's Supper, the Last Supper, with bread and wine. And here in John chapter 21, we have this breakfast on the beach over a charcoal fire, the smell of fish and the smell of smoke and the taste and smell of bread. But of course, this episode is about far more than food. This breakfast with the risen Jesus is the culmination of an amazing fishing trip, which itself is a climax to so much more with echoes of earlier days when Jesus first met Peter and James and John. And it's a great story, but what is it about? Well, it's about the mission the disciples have. It's about what their real work is. It's about how they can't do that work on their own. And it's about Jesus' invitation to them and to us to get involved. It's about the sheer joy and exhilaration of being with him, like the freshness of a new morning. And it all takes place, we read, as the morning breaks, which with John is never an accidental feature. We've mentioned several times over these last weeks uh, about John's gospel being so much about darkness and light. If you remember at the Last Supper, it tells us that Judas went out and it was night. And we have the darkness of the cross looming across those chapters 18 and 19 of John's gospel. But now the darkness is past and the light of the world has been raised to life and he brings that light to his disciples' lives and to ours. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore. It's not just about chronology, is it? It's about so much more. What a wonderful picture that is. It's an expression of all that he can bring us by way of light and hope and a future. But there's something happened before we get to that bit where Jesus stands on the shore. There are seven disciples, five are named, two are not. There is Peter, Thomas, Nathaniel, the two sons of Zebedee, who we know as James and John, and there are two unknown disciples. Don't know why they're not given names, it just doesn't tell us that. But anyway, they've been fishing all night and they've caught nothing. And they're in Galilee, which according to Mark's gospel, Jesus had told, where Jesus had told them to go. But they've been at a loose end when they got to Galilee. They've been waiting and nothing's been happening. Nothing seemed to be happening at all. And so they go back to work. Simon's Peter says, I'm going fishing. Were they right or wrong to do that? Some people think they were wrong. It was as if they'd, they'd, given, back, they'd given up and, and they'd gone back to the old ways and they'd gone back to the old world. And that's a possible interpretation, but there's not really much to go on uh, to give us that interpretation, but it's a possibility. Maybe it was just a one-off occasion because they were at a loose end. Jesus doesn't rebuke them for what they did unless you count the fact that they didn't catch anything as a silent rebuke that can you really say that even but whatever it was or wasn't it was certainly a lesson something that Jesus used to bring home to them what their real work was they went fishing without Jesus and they caught nothing when they go out on mission they'll need him with them because they are to be fishers of men and women from now on and they can't do that alone and it's to bring to mind what Jesus had already said in chapter 15, that apart from me, he said, you can do nothing. But again, that's jumping ahead a bit too quickly. They caught nothing all night. And then this figure appears on the shore, a stranger on the shore. And I'm tempted to think of Akabilk 
and all those years ago. But if I do that, your mind's going to start going back to the 1960s and what was I doing when Akabilt was playing Stranger on the show. Well, don't do that. Just uh, think about what we're saying. But there was this stranger on the shore, unrecognizable at the moment, and he calls out to them, friends, have you got any fish? And the reply is, of course, no. And the stranger calls out, well, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you'll catch some. And there's something in his voice that makes them do exactly that. And in one sentence, we hear what happens. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. And of course, they realize what has happened. It's a, it's a miracle. And they see who this stranger on the shore is. Or at least the disciple whom Jesus loved, who is probably John, almost definitely John, the writer of the gospel, the disciple, James's brother John. The disciple whom Jesus loved realized who it was. <clears throat> now, this chapter, chapter 21 of John's gospel, is almost like, I say almost, it's almost like an appendix to the main body of the gospel. Because John's gospel, and a number of folk have commented on this, John's gospel seems to finish properly at the end of chapter 20. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. That's, that's the purpose. That's right, the reason John was writing this gospel. Uh, and it seems as though that might be the end of it. But the thing is, there are no copies anywhere of John's gospel without chapter 21. No one has ever found any copies of that. So it certainly, definitely belongs here. And one of the functions of these chapters, there are several functions, but one of the functions of this last chapter is to show us some more about Peter and John, because obviously in the later church there had been a question arose, especially about John. Uh, some rumor had come about that Jesus had said that John wasn't going to die. He was going to go straight to, to heaven, straight to God's presence. And at the end of the chapter, if you know what follows from this, and that discussion between Jesus and Peter on the beach, uh, Peter says, what about him? What about John? And Jesus says, if I said this or whatever, and, and Jesus is saying, that, uh, John is saying that Jesus did not actually say that, Jesus would, that John would not die. What, Je what Jesus said was, if it is my will that he remains. There was an if there. So it's dealing with things like that. But on a more simple level, it's showing us a difference and yet the way that Peter and John work together. And it's quite important. You think of when Peter and John on that first Easter morning in John chapter 20, when they went to the tomb on that first Easter morning. Do you remember? If you got your Bibles, you could look back, just back over the page there. Well, Peter and John, they went to the tomb uh, and Peter and John were running. And John was younger, so John got there first. And it says, Simon came along, and he came along behind him. He went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went in. He saw and believed. You see, John saw and believed. Peter is the impetuous one who goes straight in there. John is the more perceptive one. And it's the same here in chapter 21. John sees Jesus and he says, it is the Lord. Surprising to me, there's only one exclamation mark there. You feel as though there should be half a dozen. It is the Lord. And it's Peter who jumps into the water, leaving everyone else to do the work. And he's out there in front, filled to overflowing with love and enthusiasm for his master. And yet, he needs the perception, the help, the insight of John before he can get going. And that's so true to life in a church. We need leaders who go in for the big splash, as it were, who, who take a risk, who step out in faith. And we need those who can see what's going on and have a perceptiveness about it. And when they work together, that's the way it should be. 
when it's done out of love for the Lord as it was here. And of course, the rest of the church, it seems, tours in uh, the nets, but that's perhaps another issue. And then Jesus, he asks for something of their catch. Bring me some of your fish. And Peter decides, well, he's going to get involved in that as well. Uh, And so he drags the net ashore as well. And it's so human and it's so real. And Peter wants to be involved wherever the master is. And we just love Peter, don't we? There is the one place where the impetuous Peter does not want to be involved. And that's anything to do with the cross, isn't it? We've seen that. And Jesus deals with that in the next part of this chapter. Peter is still the man he is for now, the one who didn't want the cross for Jesus and doesn't want the cross for himself. But here it's all excitement and exhilaration and and sheer joy. It's almost innocent in the way it's told. And you can see the picture of how, how exciting it all is. And the disciples say, look at this, 153 fish. You know, they must have counted those fish. Why else put in 153? They, 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 they couldn't believe what they'd done. But you know, the real point of this, the real point of what's going on here is that there are echoes of earlier days here. And particularly of Peter's call to follow Jesus as we find way back in Luke chapter 5. Now, there's a, there's a window here, a stained glass window in quite a few, there's Psalm 23 here, but there of Jesus on the water, and it says, uh, by Jesus' head there, it says, follow me. And there are the disciples in the boat with the fish overflowing. And that could be a reference to John 21, but it could also be a reference to Luke 5, and I think in a way, it's probably both those things because they're so closely connected. Because in Luke chapter 5, there's Peter again. He's in his boat. He's washing, mending his nets after a fruitless and frustrating night. We used to have a a convention up in, we still do have a convention, up in Dingwall, uh, near where where I used to live. And every year we'd have speakers in September would come up. One of those speakers once was a, a, a preacher from Northern Ireland called Noel Agnew. And Noel was a, a character, he was an eccentric in a way, um, maybe that's too strong, he was definitely a character, he, used to, he was a single man, a minister in Northern Ireland, spent a lot of his time with, with bikers, and every summer he went on holiday on a trawler, he spent his holidays on a fishing trawler, and one night at the convention uh, he said that uh, he'd been out with fishermen on the trawler when they caught nothing, and he said in his Irish brogue, which I'm not going to try and imitate, he said, they're not good company. Well, Peter wasn't good company that morning or that day, whenever it was, when Jesus asked to use his boat as a pulpit uh, and taught, it tells us, the kingdom of God. And Peter is sitting there in a boat, probably looking down at his nets, but unable not to hear what Jesus is saying. And somehow and somewhere, Jesus broke through Peter's sullen shell. And then Jesus told him to put out to deep water and catch fish. And on that occasion too, it was a case of a person from the land telling an expert of the sea what to do. And yet Peter recognizes his authority, soon to be proved by that huge catch so big, it tells us in Luke 5, it tore their nets. Jesus knew more about fishing than the experts did. Jesus knows more about anything than the experts do because he has the authority of the Son of God himself. He has risen from the dead and how much bigger can you get than that? And experts in any field would be wise to listen to what Jesus has to say. It's interesting, isn't it, that the wise men from the East worshipped at the feet of a child because they knew who Jesus was. But of course, Jesus is concerned with more than whatever we may be expert in. Peter was made aware of another world. And in Luke 5, it was leading up to that memorable saying in verse 10, don't be afraid. From now on, you will catch people. Or in the old ways, I will make you fishers of men. And that's what John 21 is getting at. This is where it's heading. 
How could they not have remembered that first time and those words? You know, in Luke 5, it tells us James and John were there as well. So in John 21, there's Peter and James and John and perhaps these other two at least who knew what Jesus had done in Luke chapter 5. And this is to show them what their real work is. To spread the gospel of the kingdom of God, that Easter message of Jesus crucified and risen and now Lord of all. And of the need of all people everywhere to repent and believe in him. And bringing the harvest not just of fish, but of those who believe to be the fishers of people that Jesus said. And they cannot do that on their own. No matter how expert they may be, no matter what techniques they use, no matter how high tech they are, no matter how much psychology or sociology they use, no matter how many surveys they do, how many questionnaires they put out, no matter how well they analyze all the results of statistical analysis, no matter how many courses they go on, and even no matter how many youth leaders they have, what is needed is the Lord himself. It is the Lord said John. And that's what got Peter going. And if we forget him, or try to put him somewhere along the chain of command, or even use him as a consultant, as it were, it just won't work. And it's so easy to forget who's in charge, and who has the real authority. And if a church is very successful, and has all these things we've been talking about, it must be very easy to lose sight of Christ himself and rely on method or people or expertise. But the disciples had the expertise. They went fishing at night. They'd fished at night many times before, and it worked. It didn't work this time. And if a church is not very successful, maybe it's small, maybe it has few resources, financial, human, little expertise, the temptation is still there to give in and to forget who's in charge. Or to try harder to try and get these other methods and to go on more courses and get more expensive equipment and to constantly, this is what happens, isn't it? Blame ourselves for our failure. Now maybe there are things that can be done. There's no doubt about that. But it's the same problem. Successful church, non-successful church, anything in between, we lose sight of Jesus Christ, the Lord. And the one thing all churches are in danger of forgetting is prayer. And I hope you don't think that's something to turn off at when you hear a word like prayer, because prayer is just seeking God's face for all that we do, admitting our dependence upon him before anything else. And that's what John 21 is partly about, an illustration of Jesus' words, apart from me, you can do nothing, the nets are empty. But with Jesus on the seashore at morning light, there's a, there's a wonderful hope. And I hope we can see that. Now, I know prayer can be difficult. And it's easy for me to say to you, or to sound as though I'm saying to you, you need to pray more, because I say it to myself often. And yet, maybe we just need to put that to one side, the difficulties of it, and get into this scene here. And what we find is it draws prayer from us naturally. Instead of thinking, oh dear, I've got to pray and I'm not very good at it, think yourself into this situation at the Sea of Galilee as Jesus stands on the seashore and see how that develops. He speaks and the situation changes and you see what he can do and you remember times past and what he's done for you then. And then you step onto the beach and you smell the charcoal burning. You you smell the, the fish and you see the bread. And most of all, you see him. And don't you want to be with him? Listen to him? Talk to him? Go with him wherever he goes? Maybe like Peter, you don't understand all the implications yet. But for now, this is where you want to be. And this is who you want to be with. And that's where prayer begins, with him, seeing him, and realizing that what he wants is the very best there is. There is nothing better than what he wants. We might think we want this and want that, but the best thing is what he wants, and that's what God's will is. And what Jesus wants, God wants. And that's really what we want, if we only realized it. 
And if only we could get hold of that, we'd see that spiritual things, you know, Bible reading and prayer and giving or Sunday worship and things like that, they're not, they're not duties. They're about relationship. They're about you and him and G- Jesus and the believer and all those matters of grace and love that surround us. This is a marvelous picture. Jesus on the shore with his disciples, and you know, they were a motley crew. Peter had denied him. Thomas had doubted him. Nathaniel, in whom it says there was no guile. Nathaniel was from Cana. Jesus was from Nazareth, and it's like two neighboring places where they never get on. And Nathaniel says, can anything good come out of Nazareth? There's another disciple who didn't understand what Jesus was about to begin with. There's James and John, the sons of thunder, continually arguing. Remember, they wanted to decide Jesus to tell them who was the greatest. These are the kind of people that Jesus had around him that he wanted as his disciples. People, put simply, like us. And two anonymous disciples, unknown that they're, but not unknown to Jesus, obviously, I suppose we're in there somewhere, you and I. And what does Jesus say to you and I? What does he say to them when they come to him? He says, come and have breakfast. He doesn't say, go and save the world. Not yet, anyway. Anyway, they can't do that. Only Jesus can do that. We start, first of all, by responding to that invitation. And meals together are important. There's a bread and the fish, and there's more than enough for anyone. We've seen that even when resources are limited. He fed 5,000. It's not the resources that's a problem. It's whether he is there. It's us with him, eating together and sharing fellowship and getting to know one another. How many times does Jesus say, come to him in one way or another? Dozens of times. He wants us to be with him. It says in Mark's gospel, when he chose the 12 disciples, he chose them to be with him. That's what he wants from us. And he says, come to me. And never mind for the moment all we have to do. There's no end of things to do for the kingdom of God. And before we know it, we're chasing our tails, trying to do everything at once. Jesus says, come to me because it's all about him. So let's, let's start there. Start afresh this morning, like a, an early new morning there on the beach. Let's start in our own hearts and our attitudes. Let's start at that place. And may God bless each one of us as we do that. Amen. Let's continue our worship now as we have our offerings.
Just before we pray, could I ask you to do something with me this morning? Um, last Sunday, you remember the terrible things happened in Colombo? Well, I learnt that, um, I think the day before, a friend of a friend of ours, a daughter, uh, had gone out to do a medical elective to Colombo. I think she'd arrived the day before, and she landed right in the middle of that. She's still there. And you can imagine, she's never left Scotland before. <laughs> So you can imagine the situation, the feelings, and her mother's feelings, and she's not quite sure uh, what to do. Uh, you think, well, just come home, but maybe that's not the right thing for her. We don't know. But I would ask you, please, to, to pray. Her mother's asking to pr for prayer. So if, you could, if we could pray for that when we come to that in our service this morning, I'm sure it would be greatly appreciated. So let, let's pray together. Well, we give you thanks for your goodness to us. We thank you for all that you give us materially and spiritually. And as we bring our offerings, we ask that you would use them in the service of the kingdom, of your kingdom, in the name of uh, the Lamb of God who, who took, takes away the sins of the world and who is risen for us. And Lord, we look upon that world that Jesus died for, and it's a world full of trouble and tragedy as well as all the good and wonderful things. And Lord, we remember today in Sri Lanka where there are no services today because it is just too dangerous and we can hardly imagine that. And we think of this young girl, Sarah, on her medical elective, a young girl not quite on her own as much as she was a few days ago, but still unsure and probably frightened. And Lord, we ask that you protect her, that you would watch over her and guide her into the right decisions here and for those to help her who can. And we remember a family, a mother especially, that you grant her a sense of your presence at this time. Lord, we pray for all places of, of trouble today, of, of Libya and, and Sudan as well. And we pray for your church at Easter time, your Easter people. And Lord, we pray for this congregation in all the busyness and everything that, that's involved here, uh, that all may be done with you, Lord, that we might know that you are the one who is with us always. So we remember the, the children's work with the Sunday school and the boys' brigade and girls' brigade and, and the brownies and guides and the creche and all these things. Pray for the leaders that you would Give them all they need to do their job. We remember the sisterhood and the guild and the men's club, the Kirk Session and the, the congregational board, the befriending, the community breakfast. Lord, all these things and things that perhaps I've forgotten just now, Lord, we pray for all the work of this congregation. And we commit to you too the, the work of the nominating committee 
that have to work in confidence, but we pray, Lord, that uh, we've trusted them with this job of seeking a new minister. And we pray, Lord, that your will will be done, that in your time, things would come round in your, in your way. For you are the God who knows all things, who knows the end from the beginning. And Lord, for any who are sick and need our prayers today, for any who are really struggling, Lord, and most of us know someone like that, we, we pray, Lord, you would touch their hearts and their lives with your healing touch. Lord, may they know again that you're a God who knows all about them. So, Lord, hear these, our prayers, for we bring them in Jesus' name. Amen. I hope I'm going to need this in a minute. Well, one thing I nearly forgot. Um, there was somebody who was watching. You know that our services go online, the photographed, and people can watch them through the cameras at home or watch them later in the week. Well, somebody had been watching those, and they'd seen the Easter bonnets last Sunday, and they thought they were so good that they wanted to say a special thank you, not just to the boys and girls who were wearing them, but also to the mums and dads who'd helped to make them. So isn't that great? You didn't even know anybody was watching except folks here, but somebody saw those bonnets, they thought, that's fantastic, and they wanted to say so. So it's nice to see you back after the holidays. You all have a good holiday last week when I know a lot of you were away on holiday. You have sunshine. Do you remember sunshine? Yeah. Well, there was sunshine last week, and it was great, wasn't it? Easter holidays. Now, Easter oh, Easter's not just about holidays, is it? Who can tell me what Easter is about? Is it, go on then. Tell me. When you get Easter eggs. Good enough. Good enough. It's when you get Easter eggs. I've got an Easter egg too. That's fine. Anything else? Yeah. We celebrate Jesus. It's about Jesus. What, what about Jesus? Uh, he went into a tomb. He went into a tomb after he died, and, and somebody else. And what happened after that? Go on then. He risen. He risen from the dead. That's right. So we know what Easter's about, as well as Easter eggs. That, that's a good start. Okay. Now then, last week, last week we were we had, we were talking about the empty tomb, and we were talking about how the angel said to the women when they came to the tomb, because they didn't know what had happened. He said, "Remember what he said." And so we're thinking, I wonder how good our memories are. I wonder if we can remember things. And so we had a memory verse. And I wonder if anybody who's here last week is able to say the memory verse. Who was standing up here last week? Who came up and had a, was that Luke? Well, it was me. Let's have somebody else then to come and sit. Come on then. All this. You know what the, how, how many words were there? Seven words, weren't there? And then a bit at the end. Can you remember it all? Okay, turn on what everybody see. Go on then. He has risen. No, he is not there. He has risen. Look, 24, 6. Did everybody hear that? Yeah, it's good. good. Tell you what, tell you what. Tell you what. What does that say? What does it say? I did it, so you did. There you go. Sit down. <laughs> anybody else want to have a go? Come on then. To see what kind of memories we've got. One then. He is not here. He has risen. Luke 
14, chapter 6. 24, verse 6. That was near enough. Do you think he did it? Just a minute. What does that say? So you did, right, okay. There's one more hand up, come on then, you might as well, come on then. Did... <laughs> come on then. Go on. <clears throat> he is not here. He's not here. He has risen. He has risen. Luke 24. 24. Verse 6. Let's see. Well done. Yeah, have a sticker. Here you go. That was one more. Anybody else? Come, come on, then you have a go. Come on in. He raised for the dead, and he came back to life, and everyone was happy because he was alive again. That's excellent. That was a sermon. That was, <laughs> yeah. And I know there's somebody over there who really should get a chance because they said it last week. And so they were brave lads. Thank you. Come on then. Come on in. This Luke, is it? Come on in. You did it last week, didn't you? You're going to do it this week. Go on. Here yeah, is not here. He has risen. Chapter 24, verse 6. What was the name of the book? What? Luke, yes. Can't forget that bit. What did you say? I did it. There you go. Right. Now, we've got more of these stickers, and maybe another time, maybe another time, we'll try another verse, and we'll, get, so we'll maybe get a sticker for somebody another time. So, that was all about Easter. Were you learning about Easter in Sunday school today? We talk, were you talking about Jesus after he'd risen from the dead? Were you talking about that? Yeah? Do you want to tell me what you were talking about? I hope you do, seeing as I've come all the way down here. We were talking about... Jesus rolled the stone away. Somebody rolled the stone away and yeah. Jesus came out of the tomb, didn't he? Yeah. And what did he do after that? Did he go, did he go somewhere? Did they see Jesus? Did his disciples see Jesus, his friends? No? I think they did. I think they did. Go back here. When, uh, when the tomb was empty, they didn't see Jesus. That's why they were so puzzled. They didn't know what happened. But then Jesus appeared and they realized that he had risen from the dead and he went to his friends and he told them to do something. Anybody know what Jesus told his friends to do? Go on then. He had to um, baptize them. Yeah. And that's what he told his friends. Right, okay. I know that's, that's right. I know that's what he did. He told his disciples, he says, go, go and tell everybody that about me that I've risen from the dead and go and make disciples and baptize them because that's what you do when people become disciples. And he said at the end, he says, behold, he says, I am with you always, right to the very end of the earth. So he was always with them. And that wasn't just for the disciples at that time, that was for us as well. So if we know Jesus and he's our friend, then when we've got other friends at school or wherever we are, maybe we want to tell them about another friend that we've got who is Jesus. And we know that he's with us all the time. It's really, really important. Right, we'll try another verse another time and see how good your memories are another time. But for now, we're going to finish by singing, uh, Lord of creation, to you be all praise.
May the love of the Lord Jesus draw us to himself. May the power of the Lord Jesus strengthen us for his service. May the joy of the Lord Jesus fill our souls. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forevermore.